Welcome to Untangling the World Knot of Consciousness, wrestling with the hard problems of mind and meaning in the modern scientific age. My name is John Verveke. I'm a cognitive psychologist and a cognitive scientist at the University of Toronto in Canada. Throughout the entire series, I will be joined in dialogue by my good friend and colleague, Greg Enriquez from James Madison University in the United States. Throughout, we are gonna wrestle with the hard problems of how we can give an account of a phenomenal like consciousness within the scientific worldview, how we can wrestle with that problem in conjunction with the problem that Greg calls the problem of psychology that is pervasive throughout psychology, which is that psychology has no unified descriptive metaphysics by which it talks about mind and or behavior. Throughout this, we will be talking about some of the most important philosophical, cognitive scientific, and neuroscientific accounts of consciousness. So I hope you'll join us throughout. I'm really excited about it. I've been embodying my modeling of various things throughout uh, in the last couple of weeks. So you know, I've, I've, been, I've been feeling it. So I'm looking forward to the continuation. <laughs> so uh, last time we did uh, a very long uh, analysis, one of the few times I use slides, I don't usually like to use them, uh, but uh, we did an analysis of an argument that I've been working with Dan Chiappi about uh, the use of the rovers on Mars, and that was a, basically a, a, a use that as a test case and, and as a vehicle for explicating uh, the relationship, uh, uh, sorry, first of all, the nature of uh, perspectival and participatory knowing, and then the relationship between them. We, bring, we brought in Montague's idea of mutual modeling and consciousness as some mutual modeling between participatory and perspectival knowing. And yes. so that, that's sort of where we're at right now. And what I'd like to do now is take the next step forward and, and set up a course of argument that will allow us to, together, you and I, to enter into dialogue, not only with each other, but with some of the most prominent theories of consciousness on right. the market right now, on the psychological, cognitive, scientific, and neuroscientific market, if I can put it that way. And so I, I have a proposal about how to do this. And what I want to do is I want to propose a particular... Can I, go ahead. Can go I just, ahead. Let me just pop in real fast. So, so as a meta theorist, okay, so uh, me, you know, I, I'm really looking to see how various frames assimilate and integrate key insights from various models. Okay? Yeah. And yeah. one of the things I'm so attracted about this model is that it seems to precisely do this. Okay. Right. So right. we're setting up from my vantage point, the my ear in part, is listen to the assimilation and integration capacity and how it pulls the strengths of various models together and generates coherence. That's what I'm often paying attention to. And this is what I love so much about your formulation. Thank you, Greg. That was very helpful. That was very helpful, especially for the listener. So thank you for that. Yeah, um, that's, that's exactly right. Um, that's, that's in the sense of that's what I will be in, endeavoring to demonstrate as much as possible. So I have a particular proposal about a particular strategy. I want to I want to try and give a cognitive scientific argument precisely because it does the thing that Greg just said, cognitive sciences, uh, at least I argue for a version of cognitive science in which the, this kind of meta-theoretical integration is central to the practice of cognitive science uh, because we're trying to bridge between work in artificial intelligence neuroscience, psychology, and philosophy, especially phenomenological philosophy, about uh, the nature and function of consciousness. So one of the strategies we use in cognitive science that is different uh, from uh, typically strategies that are used in psychology or in neuroscience, um, uh, and, and it overlaps with strategies used in artificial intelligence, it's called the design stance. Um, and so the design stance is this idea. You try to figure out what a phenomena is by reverse engineering. it. You try to figure out, well, if I had to build a machine, and I'll, until recently this was not a, not a strategy people could generally use, right? But now we're getting to the place where this is now becoming a plausibly viable strategy. So what, would, what I, wanna, I wanna get on the, you know, I wanna understand, let's say intelligence, general intelligence. So, and this is a project that's on right now, so right. the project is artificial general intelligence. I try to make a machine that has that. I try to design it. And by doing that, I often have to wrestle with some of the deepest and harder pro hardest problems of figuring out what the phenomena is. And it gives me a new way of trying to understand it that can be valuable to people in psychology who perhaps might be taking a more experimental approach or neuroscience who are taking an, you know, 
a, a more direct measurement approach of fMRI, EEG, et cetera. And that, so that's what I'm going to try and offer here because I think uh, that will allow us to powerfully bridge. Brilliant. So, yeah, no, I just, it's a, to me, this is, again, this is why we think so much alike. I mean, I basically reverse engineering propositional knowing with the justification yes. systems theory, basically. Exactly. And, and, and that, again, this is this big picture coherence capacity is when you reverse engineer, then all of a sudden you have a design feature and you get a lock key kind of relation potential. And then you see things from different perspectives. It deepens, raises questions. And also, I think, when it works, gets that lock key correspondence. So yes. you, the, you know, so yeah. anyway. No, no, that, that's well said. That's very well said. So I'm going, to make, I'm going to make two what I think are plausible presumptions in order to try and get, uh, take the design stance. I'm going to take it that, um, it, it, that AGI is a, a, progressive, a progressively successful project. Um, uh, I'm not saying we've made autonomous AI or anything ridiculous like that, but I think a very reasonable conclusion to draw from the last uh, 15 years is that this project is progressing and it's not even progressing in a linear fashion, it's progressing in a nonlinear fashion. And, I, and then there's a philosophical justification for that. It's basically the argument of something like this. If we can't succeed in um, coming up with intelligence out of, the, out of the physical, then I think we're doomed in trying to get the conscious out of the physical. So what I'm saying is, it's plausible that this project is progressing, AGI, and if it doesn't succeed, I think we're really doomed in trying to give an account of consciousness that can fit into the scientific worldview. So those are my two methodological presuppositions. And then what I want to do is I want to say, okay, let's say we wanted to build a machine that had AGI. And so here's, here's another part of what I'm arguing for. If we take the design stance, we will be always, if this is what the design stance does, it makes you always move between, and you, you alluded to this, always move between and try to integrate the function issue and the nature issue. Yeah. And when I'm trying to design something, I mean, I'm obviously trying to make it function, but if I'm doing the genuine design stance, I'm also trying to bring it into existence. So the design stance is linking the design function thing together. And by trying to design artificial general intelligence, we're, uh, we're gonna try and explicate and justify the intuition that there's deep connections, the deep intuition that there's deep connections between intelligence and consciousness. Yes. Okay. Really? So, yep. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the methodological, uh, just the, sorry, the justification of my method. So it's a methodological justification. So what I want to start with is the idea that what's at the core of intelligence is a capacity uh, for relevance realization and We've, we've talked about this a lot. I've argued this in many places elsewhere. You've, and you've published on it, uh, we've published on it together. Like, so there's just, I'm not gonna recapitulate that argument. It's out there, there's a lot yeah. of material on that. And we've also touched on it and discussed it also at length here. So yeah. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna assume that that's one huge component of what is needed in order to be in intelligent systems. And when we say relevance realization, I, I, I sometimes want to put in a third R and make it RRR because we're actually talking about a massively recursive because we've been talking recursive. about that yep. also throughout this whole argument. That's right. It's massively recursive right. uh, relevance realization. And then that's, that's going to be relate to things like the uh, dynamic interrelation of perspectival participatory modeling yep. across yep. lots of people. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Well said. It's really good to be doing this with you, man. It's just like this. <laughs> It's really good. Um, like just that, like you do those little things and, and they're just, they're, 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 they're wonderful. They're, they're seamless, but they also tie things together. So I just want to compliment you on that because- Thank you, friend. Appreciate that. Great. It's fun, fun to be here. Fun to be here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what, uh, what I want to do now is uh, make another step. Uh, and this is, uh, there's a sense in which I don't need to go into this in great detail for the argument you and I are gonna to explore today, but I do want to indicate to people that the, the deep version of this argument is forthcoming. And I wanna, I'm working on this argument right now with a former student of mine, and he's, he's also a student of Andy Carlix, uh, Mark, and, Mark Miller, and then another person I just met because he reached out to me uh, because of the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis area, Brett Anderson, and what 
we are, are what we're really working on very hard is uh, the idea that we can integrate relevance realization theory with the predictive processing models, especially that have come out, you know, around Clark's work and Kristen's work, and I know you're very familiar with them. Yep. Mm -hmm. Familiar with them too. And then, and then the idea here is, and then, and the version of predictive processing that Mark especially thinks will help make this work is not so much the uh, the standard computational one, but very much a 4E cognitive science where embodiment yep. in action and all that is is the best interpretation of how it works. That's super exciting uh, for me in my you know 30,000 uh, foot view that I tend to take. When yeah. I'm thinking about what is information, you know, I talk about information processing system that's input, recursive computation and output systems, okay? I talk about semantic information and I talk about information theoretic, okay? Yeah. So now if we have relevance realization, pulling information processing and semantic, and then we loop it into information thor theoretic and the predictive capacity of extracting, you know, and reducing uncertainty, man, you are pulling uh, things yeah. together. So I think some of the most recent work on uh, integrating uh, the information theoretic approach with the semantic information idea it, it, it is, works exactly along these lines. Um, and perhaps that, that's something we could get back to. Mm -hmm. at point. But so again, think, assimilation, integration, and connecting yeah. with coherence. Yeah, it's all, it's, all, it's all converging in that way. So what are the things where, first of all, in place people are not aware of it, like a, a very quick, very quick primer on predictive processing. And so the idea, the predictive processing model it, um, it is the idea that what the brain is primarily trying to do is uh, predict. Now, notice how that immediately sounds like we're at the propositional level. And that's why I took, took time to indicate that, you no, know, where, where Brett and where Brent and Mark and I are working is at a, a deeper level, um, uh, uh, you know, at, more at the perspectival, per, very much more at the perspectival participant level. Actually, I'll, I shared on my list uh, a little uh, five minute uh, clip of a spider web and is a spider web an extension of its mind? Okay, ah, so we, and how it utilizes that to model and sense and expand its sensory feedback. Oh, that's system. very cool. That's very uh, cool. So we can, you know, make that, yeah, we're talking about a level of potentially a spider here, okay? So yeah, relation, yeah. right? Not at narrative prediction no, uh, and justification. No, exactly, exactly. And at some point I wanna to talk to you about that when we move to narrative how that starts to afford the justification problem. But, yeah. uh, well, again, <laughs> right, I'll take that one. <laughs> I'll take that one. <laughs> too, too, many, too many candies. Okay, so uh, the basic idea of the predictive processing model and so um, is that what this brain is finally const constantly trying to do is sort of predict its environment. The problem with that, uh, the idea is it can't really directly predict its environment. So what it can directly do is predict itself. So the idea is that, and so this is, I think, central to it. It's making use of sort of a, a Bayesian idea of how you alter um, the uh, assigned probability uh, of a belief. I don't like this language, uh, but based on evidence, because it's all very propositional. We're trying to drop below that level. So I'm not gonna keep saying that. I'm gonna, I'm I'm gonna accept that people understand that we're just using these words as stand-ins. So the idea is what the brain does is Higher levels of the brain, so you think of the brain as hierarchically organized, and Greg has you know, emphasized this multiple times, right? Uh, I think there's a very much a consensus view about that, right? Is that uh, it's a neural network in which, uh, here's the lowest level. This is the level that's in direct sensory motor contact with the world. And then this level, what it tries to do is predict this level. And then the idea is, right, and then there's a level of, above that that tries to predict that level and so on and so forth. Yep. And then the idea is by trying to reduce how surprised it is by what the lower levels are doing, indirectly, it will start to predict, pat, it will start to zero in and predict the real patterns in the world. Is that right. fair enough so far, Greg? Absolutely. And we're going to, let's just uh, asterisk the word surprise there. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Because then when you get surprised, you will then pull, and then there's going to be energy to try to model that surprise and then readjust. Right. And, and so that, these, are, these are places, by the way, where relevance realization comes in because predictive processing talks about revising the model or making alternative models. And that's actually an issue around relevance um, and relevance realization because what the system is also facing as a problem is uh, it's, it's modeling uh, the hidden causes in the world 
it's what, what I mean by hidden causes. It's trying to create, by predicting what's going to happen at the le lowest level, it's actually creating at least a, a procedural model of the causal patterns in the world that are making those patterns on, uh, in, the, in the sensory motor. And the system can adjust by altering its predictions or by altering the world to make them conform to the predictions. And so there, it's, you can see how it right, gets you right into the sensory motor loop. And then yeah. the, but, but the idea there is, okay, but it's often having to predict things at multiple temporal scales. Like right now, like, because the question of what should it model, of course, the relevance realization question, yep. what's happening right now, what's happening a little deeper in the environment, longitudinal. And then the idea is there, the layers in some sense correspond to these temporal and spatial scopes. And then what you're doing is this hugely dynamic, massively recursive uh, uh, process in which error signals from the layers permeate up and then correction signals or action signals permeate down. And now notice what we've got, Greg. We've got what we've been talking about a lot, right? We've got mm -hmm. a machine that is set up to do a, an important kind of relevance realization. Why? Mm -hmm. Because as it goes up, it's doing data compression. It's yep. doing massive data compression. As it comes down, it's doing massive data particularization. It's doing this in a hugely complex, you right. know, process uh, uh, of dynamical self-organization. And what is it doing? It's regulating the sensory motor loop because it's updating its models, but it's also changing the world with action. And so you've got this loop and this loop happen. And so you can see, I mean, I can, I'm not going to go into the technical details, but you can see how relevance realization theory and predictive processing theory just really go really, really nicely together. And you can just, I mean, for me at least, you see the fractal line, the fractal yeah. line, you know, back and forth, basically. Yeah, exactly. Well said. And so what we're, we're seeing here, is, and I want to sort of say this carefully, I wrote it down because it, you can, I'm making a, like you said, I'm making an assimilation space for where the mutual modeling kind of idea can come in. But what we've got, notice how the, the brain is actually modeling itself in this massively recursive manner in order to model the world. And in modeling the world, it's always also modeling itself. This goes to the work of Hoey and, uh, and Michaels and their work on the predictive processing models of the self. And mm -hmm. you and I are gonna talk about the self at some point too. Indeed. Um, <laughs> uh, because, they, because one of the things, one of the error signals I get, right, in the environment is precisely because of the way my body and my actions are altering my perception. For example, I'm blinking right now. Okay, yep. so I have to, my system has to learn to discount that I'm a blinker. It has to learn to discount that I have a limited visual scope, but that it can, so it, what it does is it's also reciprocally modeling itself as it right. models the world. So it's modeling itself in these layers, but it's also creating a model of itself as it's modeling the world. So you see massive mutual modeling right. going on here. Massive. It's, it's, it's got to have a model so it can factor itself out as it shifts yeah. so that it maintains, you know, the, the signal, uh, you know, relative to the noise that's created by its own shifts. So you can think of it even having, a, 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 so while it is doing this massive recursive mo self like modeling, mm -hmm. it's also modeling a self in, in, right. a, in, in, in a sense. Well, this is why I often talk about animal environment relation. That's between yeah. model. It's yes. Animal environment relation is yes. being model. You got to model the animal, model the environment, and then model the dynamic relation. And that's a, and in order to maintain the control necessary con hierarchical control feedback systems across time. Those are the variables that definitely need it. Exactly. And so ultimately, what is constraining all of this is how, again, so that's not completely, you know. Uh, that doesn't completely answer uh, like what is modeled and how is it modeled. Right. Because it's ultimately about how is it relevant, this notion of self-relevance, how is it ultimately relevant to an adaptive, autonomous, autopoetic system? And again, that's another place in which the relevance realization machinery comes in. It has to do technically more specifically with the way the predictive processing model talks about how attention uh, it, it, it is altering salience. But I won't go into the details, right? We, what we've got is, okay, we've already got, you know, massively recursive uh, relevance realization, predictive pro processing, multi-layer and multi-dimensional mutual modeling going on. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so far, I'm I'm there. <laughs> okay, so let's say we can. We've got we've got predictive processing uh, networks. Uh, let's say the work that I've been doing over the, all these time, all these years. Um, we've got some. Uh, we've got a naturalistic account of relevance realization. So we could give everything I've described so far could be given to a machine. Okay, now we're ready to start. Is it, can we just set the machine in the world? No, because we're going to face some problems. Um, now these problems, it's not. I, I don't want to. I'm not trying to convey that people in predictive processing are not aware of these problems. I'm building this out step by step. So we as a group, you and I and potential uh, viewers can, can track the development of the argument, okay? Mm -hmm. So what we, we, we encounter this problem. Okay, we've got this system and it's gotta be doing all this, but at some point it's taking in signal from the world. At some point it's engaged in the project, like you've said already, of taking information in the information theoretic sense and converting it into something that is meaningful and useful to it. So at the very beginning, we have a problem that is called signal detection problem. Okay. And, and what we're gonna, why I'm stopping here is because one of the prominent theories of consciousness, the neuroscientific theories of consciousness, runs directly off this signal detection problem. That's why, that's why I'm gonna stop at these certain roadblocks. Right. Every roadblock mm -hmm. is associated with, maybe roadblock isn't the right way, but anyways, <laughs> is, is associated uh, with- A guidepost, and then we want to stop and then organize this, and this is the pieces uh, that we can hone in on and pull from, assimilate, and integrate. Exactly, exactly. So what's the signal detection problem? The signal detection problem is the idea that there's all the, all, there's information I want. There's information that is some sense relevant to the organism, but the problem with that, because information in the technical sense is just covariations between events in the world, right? That the information I want is always enmeshed and overlapped with the information I don't want. The yep. way this is referred to in the literature is signal and noise. Noise doesn't mean just auditory noise. It means any event in the environment, anything that you are, that you could potentially take as signal, but that you don't want. Let me give a concrete example, okay? So you're a gazelle, right? and you hear a noise in the bush, okay? Now, the problem facing you is this. Is that a signal for a leopard? That would be signal. So does that noise, does that sound, I'll use the word sound, does that sound from the bush, is that signal? Is that predicting that a leopard is there? Remember the predictive right. processing stuff? Yep. Or is it being caused by the wind and all it's predicting is the wind is going to continue to blow. Right. Now, you can't tell, right? You can't tell. So the idea is if, if this is the population of all the signals, it overlaps with all the population. So there's, there's lots of times, and this is a perennial problem for us, where we're yep. facing this kind of pollution of signal by noise. Now, what you can say is, well, I'll, what I'll do is I'll gather more information. You can. But the, but the problem is the problem regresses as you try to gather more information. When you step back and try to get information to get certainty about the first thing, you'll encounter this same problem again and again and again. Okay. More so, noise comes along. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, there's some versions of this where the noise expands exponentially uh, as you try and explore for, for the signal that will mm -hmm. initially resolve your, your primary signal. You get a combinatorial explosion. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. So what does signal detection theory say we do? So signal detection theory says we, we, what we do is we set a criteria. So this is a top-down act. What we do is, I'm gonna have to use anthropomorphic language, okay? But that's because language is anthropomorphic. So somehow the brain decides, right, that it's gonna, it's, so let's say here's the two graphs overlapping, it's gonna set a criterion. And what it means by that is, it's gonna count anything right, below a certain threshold as noise mm -hmm. and anything above a certain threshold as signal. Yep. Now, let's take a look at the gazelle because the gazelle, the, the two errors the gazelle can make are not equally in terms of their relevance to the gazelle, mm -hmm. right? So if the gazelle makes a, this mistake, it hears the sound and takes it to be the wind, and it's a leopard, whoa, 
that's a very dangerous mistake. That's you don't make too many of those mistakes. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> but there's another mistake it can make. It could, it could hear the sound, predict a leopard, and it turns out to just be the wind, but now it's running around and all the other gazelles laugh at it. Now, it can't do this infinitely because it will burn up all of its caloric energy. So it can't just say, always run away. That won't work. But what do gazelles do? And again, not anthropomorphically, even though the language sounds that way. Mm -hmm. They set the criterion, like really, real, depending on how you draw your graph. I'll, uh, right, I'll talk about it this way. They set the criterion very low, which is they'll count almost all of the sounds as signaling the leopard, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. it's much more dangerous for them to miss a leopard than to mistake the wind for a leopard. But, right. but notice how this is a relevance realization project. Depending on the situation and depending on my state, that can be completely inverted, where a mistake is much more worse for me, much more relevant to me than a miss. So it's not like you can set the criterion like here, right? You have to constantly adjust and move the criterion. And you're constantly doing that in terms, well, I would argue, of relevance realization. What is your state? How are things relevant and important to you? What's the context? What's the relevance, of, what's the, relevance the, the comparative relevance of the two risks? This is known as error management theory. Right, right. And, and sensitivity, specificity? Yep, yep, all those things. Okay. And so, well, like, people even use error management theory, and I think plausibly to try and explain some of our cognitive biases, why yeah. we're biased to make the things we do, the kinds of mistakes we do. Uh, let me give one that's, I think, non-controversial. Um, you will... You, when things are approaching you, you see them approaching you uh, in an illusory fashion. You see them coming towards you much faster than they actually are. But when mm -hmm. they're receding from you, you're accurate. It's like, mm -hmm. well, why? Well, because if I screw this one up, it's very costly. Duck. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, right. So the idea is, and you can see, you can even talk about like confirmation bias and other biases in this term. Again, those those right. heuristic functions that help us with relevance realization. Yep. Okay. Is this okay so far? Totally. I'll just uh, I'll throw in. So I, we got a dog named Benji. He's very skittish. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that basically every loud noise, everything is then very low threshold for yeah. threat. You know. So he's just yeah. like, and all of a sudden, jump into to escape and run back up into his, underneath his bed and hide. Okay. So <laughs> that's just whatever he set out. I've seen other dogs unbelievably relax. Actually, that gets into a tendency towards neuroticism at a dispositional level. But yeah, anyway, yeah, that's a, yeah. Well, well, and we could talk about that about the, the degree to which you know personality is a, 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 a very longitudinal setting of, of some of these things. Right. Yeah, we'll, we'll flag that for later. <laughs> yeah, because well, yeah. Let's just do everything. No, let's just do it all. Okay. <laughs> um, so here's where we get a theory of consciousness, actually, on the literature, um, and it's by Lau L A. W. And this goes to some work I've done with Richard Wu, especially Richard Wu, but also Anderson Todd. And so what Lau argues is that what any good theory of consciousness has to do is to be able to tell you the difference between consciousness and blindsight. So you remember what blindsight is? Blindsight is that phenomena where people can intelligently pick up on the co-variations in the environment, but yep. they are phenomenologically blind. So they don't have any adjectival qualia, but you can, let's say, you can do stuff like this. You can put a stick in front of them and say, right, and then and they'll and you say, can you see the stick? And they'll say, what's wrong with you? You're an asshole. I'm blind. Mm -hmm. You say, but the, 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 where do you think the stick is? Oh, mm -hmm. and you can, oh, it's there. I'm just guessing. <laughs> and you can even say, well, continue guessing. What angle do you think the stick is at? Oh, right. it's a, uh, 45 degrees. They can do stuff like that. Okay. It, that's by all. Wise France is the primary guy. Consciousness Lost and Found is a really good book on that. Yeah, exactly. So what Lau proposes is the following, that right, there's two things that go into signal detection. There's what he calls the sensitivity of the system. That's just its ability to pick up on the covariations. Mm -hmm. right? And he says that's what blindsight is. Blindsight is a reliable picking up on the covariations. Mm -hmm. and notice the language from Descartes coming in here mm -hmm. right away. Mm -hmm. Right? right? Mm -hmm. You're picking up on the covariations, but you don't actually have anything like a representation, right? And so what Lau says is what, ha what, what, what turns that blind sight 
detection of covariation into consciousness is the second part of signal detection, which is setting the criterion. Mm -hmm. So when the brain sets the criterion, this is, think about this, Descartes would love this. This is a way in which the covariations are being made ready for reason okay. because they're being sorted, right, in order to generate behavior that is relevant to the organism. Isn't that I mean, that's, Descartes would go, oh my gosh. I mean, that's honest. Right, no, uh, absolutely. absolutely. And, and so the idea here is the, the difference between consciousness and um, blind sight is the setting of the criterion that in some, in an important way is now allowing you to turn the, the right, turn the, co sort the covariations. You're doing a kind of, like I said, looking through the covariations. You're starting to sort them in terms of their behavioral uh, and, and task relevance. Right. And so I, I think that's beautiful. Now what Lau doesn't say, I mean, I don't, th I don't think he thinks this is a comprehensive theory of mm -hmm. consciousness. He, by the way, thinks that the setting of the criterion is, remember we talked about Rosenthal and the yep. higher order? He yep. thinks that that is the, the, the higher order action, right? The, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. So that nicely. That fits very nicely. But he doesn't think that this is a comprehensive account of consciousness. It doesn't explain most of the phenomenal properties of mm -hmm. consciousness or anything like that. But if we're going to make, now notice what happened. We're just trying to make an organism intelligent. We're just trying to give it the ability to do signal detection. And already, boom, we're starting to have to bring in a lot of the machinery that is intimately associated with the function and perhaps even the nature of yep. consciousness. Now, here's, mm -hmm. here's the point that I make with the help of Richard. And, uh, and Anderson is yet, but Lau does not give us any account of how the criterion is set. And remember, mm. the setting of the criterion is dynamic. The criterion has to be constantly has to be. set. Mm -hmm. And not only that, the example, right, the, the way I'm talking about this is unidimensional. I'm talking about as if I'm setting one criterion. Right. But what I'm doing is a mul I'm setting criterion in for many different signals yep. in terms of many different, Right, and you, so I'm going to need that. I'm going to be needing to. Set, I'm going to be needing to set this criterion in a massively recursive, right, right. dynamic, right. self-organizing manner. So, Go ahead. So, so essentially, if we're, okay. So we're going to pull some sen sensitivity and then pull in some criteria. That's then going to have a figure ground relation. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. then, what are we going to aspectualize about the figure relative to the ground? Well, that's going to change enormously, depending on a whole bunch of different kinds of contexts. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And you can see how what you're going to need is you're going to need relevance realization within this, you know, this massively recursive totally. processing model. Okay. okay. So already, intelligence and consciousness are already co-emerging together, and I want to stop and take note of that. Right at the very beginning of the project of trying to make a system give a system AGI, we're starting to do that. Okay, so now let's go into that idea of prediction and let's talk about some of the stuff we've already alluded to. What we're actually talking about, I think this is a much better term by the way, is we're actually talking about anticipation. We're talking about that the system is in a highly integrated fashion, predicting the world, predicting itself, and predicting the relationship between those. Uh, that's really nice. Actually, I hadn't heard that, but it immediately resonates because it does get you out of your propositional, yep. you know, and get you into intuitive perspectival participatory. You anticipate exactly. much more than, oh, I'm going to hypothesize and predict. I exactly. mean, at least just at an intuitive level, it resonates more. Well, no, and it, I think it goes very well with your behavioral investment theory, and here's how I think so. So the, the system is like doing this prediction, and within that, it's already doing what we talk about. It has to be setting the criterion. It's doing all this stuff, right? Yep. But what it, uh, it's also forming a model of itself. It has to be. Yep. And those are being right, mutually modeled. And notice yep. what it has to do. We can think of prediction. The anticipation is made up of prediction, which mm -hmm. is actually picking up on these patterns and then setting the criterion, right? right? But we also can think of it, and here's where I think it comes in, as preparation. Yes. Right? Anticipation mm -hmm. is prediction right. and preparation. And preparation is not just to have a model of the self. It is to use that model to shape how you're going to invest your. That's right. Right. That's right. And, and when you're actually engaged in the investment, what you're actually doing is you're breaking up little parts of investment because a huge amount of what your goals are often are nested hierarchies of goals. Exactly. Exactly. Right? 
Uh, and so then you have to anticipate there's, there's the immediate goal and then there's a mid-level goal, there's a higher order goal and all of that's gotta be sorted. And then you're organizing and coordinating the pattern of dynamic investment relation. Excellent. So let's take all of that. And what we've got is we've got this hierarchical, multi-scale, doing exactly what Greg just said, right? And it's doing the relevance realization, the predictive processing, but also the criterion setting and it's, uh, did you drop signal there for a second? I did. No, I'm here. Okay, I'm fine. So I think, I think we're okay. Uh, okay, okay, so, right, you're doing all of that. And so what we're basically doing is what I've already alluded to. We're picking up these, these covariations that are covariations that are actually picking up on affordances because they're not just predictions of the world, they're anticipations. So this is, Picking up on covariations that are affordances that my, my signal for you keeps dropping. I'm not quite sure why. But you're you're not getting any problem on your end, right? Actually, my end's been clear. So okay, well, I'll just assume that it's just something insignificant then. And so okay. notice what we've got. We've got covariations that are actually affordances because we're talking about anticipation, not just mm -hmm. but a pure prediction. And then we're now doing this massively you know, massively recursive process of compressing and particularizing them. And that's constraining the sensory motor loop. And I propose to you that is a very powerful way in which we're doing what Descartes wanted, right? Yep. We're, we're, we're doing some significant compression, actually deep learning on the covariations, and we're detecting through them, which is exactly what the predictive processing model says. We're detecting through. We're actually figuring out what the deep causes are. Really. Let's put it actually in the here and now. So what you're, as you track the screen, right? You're yeah. making anticipations about what my movements will be or what's, yeah. what you're expecting. Yeah. And when it freezes, right? Then you get surprised. Then you activate like, well, okay, what's actually happening? You shift them yeah. frame yeah. of reference, right? Yeah. Because, yeah. The, because the scale modeling across the various perspectival yeah. and participatory is not that it gets off and then all of a sudden you have to wait. Right, right? It's because I don't want to treat all the surprises as equally salient or relevant. When you're <laughs> both, right? That's important. But right. you know, if your hair moves in a way that I didn't really anticipate because I didn't realize that you've got a haircut, right? I don't go, oh, I mean, I might if it's a particularly beautiful haircut, but right. you know, I, chances are it's not going to do much for you. <laughs> Certainly not with me. <laughs> so as, as Greg said a few minutes ago, we're talking about how we're getting basically at least proto-aspectualization Proto representation. We're getting this process in which we are starting to do that whole process of sizing up. We're starting to get the very beginnings of perspectival knowing. But notice how much it's enmeshed in participatory knowing because the system models itself to model the world, and in modeling the world, it models itself. There is a deep knowing by conformity there. Amen. Okay. So now we get to the next theory because we've talked about how this is so massively recursive and self-organizing, which means it's inherently dynamical, which means it's inherently developmental. It's inherently developmental as both the relevance realization theory and the predictive processing theory are. Mm -hmm. So this takes us to Clearman's and Clearman's theory is probably the theory of consciousness that gives pride of place to developmental explanations. Okay. He has what he calls the radical plasticity hypothesis, where plasticity mm -hmm. is uh, a system's capacity to literally redesign itself, reshape mm -hmm. itself, in order to make itself more adaptively fit to the environment. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot over the last two decades about how plastic the brain is, brain mm -hmm. plasticity, and he's invoking that. And so he has an idea, he has an argument, and this is one that many people will go, wait, really? Where he thinks consciousness is something that develops. He doesn't think, now where it begins a development, of course, he doesn't say, and that of course doesn't, so it's not gonna resolve any of our ethical issues uh, about you know, when, the, when does consciousness begin. But what he says is that consciousness is actually something you learn to do, which is really interesting. That's very, that's now, this is the part where Descartes is going to get very stern. What do you mean? Right? right. How, how can you learn consciousness? As long as you have the, the immaterial goo in your head, you're conscious. And Clermont is saying, well, no, what actually has to happen, is, and think about what we said, all this machinery has to train up and evolve 
before it's going to get some of the capacities that are needed for consciousness. So he, like Lau, follows Rosenthal. That's why I spent so much time on Rosenthal, yep. right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and making the deep connections between Rosenthal's theory and aspectualization. He says, well, and notice how this fits in with the predictive processing. What's mm -hmm. happening is, right, you're doing this training up and the higher levels are learning to meta represent the lower levels. We don't, we don't have to be bound to that language because we can already right. use this other language. And what's interesting about it, he acknowledges, he acknowledges that it's not enough for the upper levels to represent or even to track the lower levels. He says that what turns them into consciousness is they, they care about the lower levels, right? Mm -hmm. They, right? Mm -hmm. They, right? <laughs> there, there's an emotional or at least an after. Heidegger would appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I thought you would. Mark does too, because Mark thinks, uh, that the affective components within the self-organization of predictive processing are doing a lot of the important work yeah. there. I, I, actually, I, th I, I said Heidegger would appreciate it, but I appreciate it also. Okay, well, like, oh, as yeah. in like oh. Martin Heidegger in terms of oh, the well, core of our being and caring. Yes, and caring. And, 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 but yes, but well, I appreciate it. <laughs> that's, that's, such a, that's such a synchronistic uh, segue because, of course, I follow Dreyfus in mm -hmm. arguing that Heidegger's primordial notion of care is yep. relevance realization. Yay! Yeah. Right? Yeah. And often <laughs> you who says, you know, the difference between our processing and the computer's processing is, is it doesn't care about the information, mm -hmm. right? Because it doesn't have to take care of itself. I was trying to show care by setting you up. <laughs> <laughs> you did it. You did it extremely well. So as soon as we get to this theory, right, and notice how it works. Because the system is like developmental, development means a system is autopoetic. It's taking care of itself. It's making itself. And that, and because of that, it cares for itself and higher levels of processing care about, right? And so you've got, right, relevance realization within that's affording relevance realization without. And so, Brilliant. okay, so we're so, there. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw in a couple of, uh, so the last, there are six principles of behavioral investment that organize it. Uh, principle four is our computational control principle, which is basically the hardware. Principle five is the constant iterative learning process. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and yeah. principle six is the lifespan developmental history process. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, the sort of example that I use in relationship to my own personal world there sort of in terms of reorganizing, anybody that's been through adolescence may remember how you get reorganized. <laughs> so at, when I was 11, I thought of the world in one way, and let's say, say girls one way. And then at 12 and 13, I thought very differently as yeah. some sort of reorganization <laughs> of relevance realization happened in those two year periods. So definitely, that you know, definitely happening. Of how yeah. development in consciousness really yeah, you put it in those terms, you realize how radically your consciousness can shift depending on developmental and learning histories. Excellent. So notice again, why did we have to bring in development? Because if we're going to make an intelligent system, we're going to give it relevant recursive relevance realization, we're going to give it deep learning in right, hierarchical uh, predictive processing networks, and those are inherently self-organizing, inherently developmental, et cetera, et cetera. Autopoiesis is inherently developmental. So we've at, we just what we we're giving it the basic machinery of intelligence, relevance realization, predictive processing, signal detection, and the capacity for plasticity and development. And we're just building in more and more of a case for the machinery of consciousness. Yep. Okay. So now let's go to the something we talked about last time, which is you're starting to get higher levels of coordination. You're trying to coordinate right all this processing and. I think we're now at a place where we can start talking about, well, you've got all this mutual modeling going on, but there's a sense in which you're going to get very higher order sort of. So the mutual modeling is also going to lead to the abstraction of a very generalized model of oneself and the world, a space, if you allow me a metaphor, sure. in which that can be coordinated to at various different degrees. Yep. And, and so this automatically sets up, and you know where this is gonna go, this sets up the global workspace theory, which yep. is right, the idea that consciousness is a like your desktop of your computer. And so what's the model here? Okay, so the model is you have all this processing going on, think about all these layers, right? Right, and all these dimensions, and most of the, those 
thought processing is unconscious. Like most of the files in your computer are unconscious. But what you can do is you can activate them by bringing them onto your desktop. Your desktop can potentially access all or at least most of the files. Yep. Right? So you can access that. And then what, when, when you make it active, what can you do? Well, you, you basically can make it interact and reintegrate with other pieces of information. And then you can broadcast it back. You can store it. You can store it in multiple locations. And so the idea is, he also uses the metaphor of a theater, right? Yep. Consciousness is, uh, what consciousness is, the stage is working memory. And mm -hmm. then... I don't like this model of attention, but I can put it aside for now. The spotlight of attention. Shot. I don't mind it, so I, I'll take the spotlight a little bit. <laughs> so, no, that's fine. I think I think the model of attention that comes out of uh, out of you know Walt, Waltz and, and and Christopher Mole has is much more about relevance, realization, and integration than just shining. Because I don't think that ceiling is shined. I think it's. It's, it's much more complex. Yeah, my fame of broadband and, and the intentional filter iterative process is, anyway, whatever, we can, we can talk yeah. about that. Well, so we can come back to anyway, that. I think we're, yeah, we'll come back, we can potentially come back to uh, consciousness and attention later. But let's go with, so you have this model of, you know, the people in the audience are, are, are right, unconscious and the people behind the stage are like the unconscious. But the stage people are more like the top-down processing, mm -hmm. and the audience is more like the bottom-up processing. And then you've got the stage of working memory, and then the spotlight of attention shines on it, and that's consciousness. So the idea is that, right, you have all your, or to use the computer metaphor, you have all your files, they're the unconscious. You draw them into the desk space, and when you're manipulating them, that's shining the spotlight yep. of attention and, re, and restructuring them. Remember that. Restructuring yep. them. And then sending them back to memory, that's what the function of consciousness is. Yep. And this is really cool because uh, obviously now they're, and, and so the, uh, the originator of this theory, it's, it's current defender, although there are many people who defend it, it's a, it's a very prominent theory, is Bernard Bars. It's called mm -hmm. the Global Workspace Theory. And right. he explicitly argues, and I, I demonstrated that in the model, that there's this terrific overlap between working memory attention and consciousness yep and what's okay so i want to pause right here right now why why is that part of this argument well what what do measures of what are working what are measures of working memory really highly correlated with measures of general intelligence Gee. yeah exactly <laughs> and what does working memory do we used to think it was just a holding space and that's what sort of a bit on uh a bit con conveyed by the the the, the stage model, but the work of my colleague, uh, really brilliant work, Lynn Hasher at the University of Toronto, has basically mm. said, no, no, that's, that's too simplistic. What working memory is, it's a higher order filter for relevance. Mm. And you know how you know that that's how, what working mm. memory does? Because mm -hmm. of the phenomena of chunking. Remember, mm. we've talked about this. If yep. I give you a string of letters and there's no pattern in it, and there's like mm -hmm. 12 of them, and I ask you to remember that string of letters, and you turn and look, you'll remember four or five. But if I turn that string of uh, 12 letters into four words like pig and cat and dog mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. mat and sit, then you can do it because they're yep. chunked, right? And so chunking shows that what working memory is doing is it's some kind of higher order relevance filter. Mm. Hmm. So notice what we're getting. This theory is deeply connecting consciousness and intelligence together, and it's mm -hmm. doing it in terms of a function strongly associated with working memory, which is relevance realization. And that is explicitly what VARS says the global workspace is set up to do. Greg, are you still there? Are you back? I did lose you there. <laughs> That time, my screen was fine. So, are we Hello? okay now, I think? Looks like we're stable. How far did, how far did you hear? Uh, good question. Um, relevance, uh, working memory, uh, chunking into just that, right, yeah, it was, it was basically at the point of chunking. Right, uh, so the point I'm making is, uh, notice what we've got in this theory. We've got a deep interconnection between intelligence and consciousness 
via working memory, right. and that's in terms of recursive relevance realization going on at the level of working memory. It's yeah. capacity to do chunking and restructuring. Right. right? Yep. And then bars, and also Shanahan and bars, have explicitly mm -hmm. argued that that is the function of the global workspace. They specifically argue that the function of the global workspace is to solve the frame problem, which Shanahan has argued is, is now ba is basically, he specifically says this, it is the relevance problem. It is the deep problem of relevance. And they argue that the function of the global workspace is in fact to do relevant realization. Yep. Yeah. Now I don't totally agree with so, their solution, uh, but that's not, we don't need that right now. I just happen to have this on my uh, desk. So this is a global yeah, neuronal yeah, workspace. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so just for people that, so that linkage immediately then gets into brain. So what he does there, some of the beautiful stuff that he does there is he, he talks about the consciousness ignition uh, switch, okay, which is basically, so he does lots of subliminal processing. Uh, so if you give something about 200 milliseconds, uh, you start yeah. to get networking, but you do not get, you know, criteria, maybe relevance yeah, realization yeah, yeah, and then yeah, that yeah, networks yeah. that thing, right? But at 300 uh, milliseconds, when you get enough top down, you get an ignition switch between parietal and frontal lobe. And, yeah. the, and that very much, that cascade very much corresponds to conscious access, right? Where you can then say, oh, this is what I now have this on my screen. This got into uh, the stage. And, and so now you get that kind of linkage. Excellent. Excellent. I'm going to pause here because you're frozen again, Greg. Yeah, the connection seems to be weak. I don't think it's on my end. My signal looks really good. Um, may, yeah, maybe we're just getting interference somewhere, but I seem we seem to be back. <laughs> so I, the thing you just did, I hope we got it all. You brought in Dehane and you brought in the, you know, the 200 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds, mm -hmm. get the consciousness ignition when you get the, the prefrontal and the, the, the parietal, the frontal and the parietal linking up. I want to also, again, go the other way. One of the most prominent theories of general intelligence is the PFIT theory. The, you know, the frontal parietal connection is yep. what makes us intelligent. It's, uh, that's G. So again, the G machinery and the conscious machinery like this, like this. Um, both at the level of the theory, relevance realization, and at the level of the anatomy. All right. Okay. So what we're doing is... I want to just draw this out again. We're, we're showing all the way through, as we're building intelligence, the machinery of relevance realization and uh, the machinery of perspectival and participatory knowing are coming along. We're getting, we're getting the machinery of consciousness, the functionality, and also some of, of the phenomenology is emerging because we've spent a lot of time showing how you can get a lot of the phenomenology, the adverbial qualia, the perspectival knowing, the participatory knowing, you can get all of that out of this kind of relevance realization machinery. Hmm. Yeah, we seem, seem, seem to be getting some intermittent interference here. Uh, de <laughs> There's definitely, right. Uh, <laughs> we're having trouble mo mutual modeling here to maintain <laughs> the connection. Uh, no, I think what it is is the is is we're on the actual we're on the verge of solving this problem. Right, and, and, and somebody tracking Illuminati don't want us to know. <laughs> don't have to right. figure out consciousness. Oh, yeah, they're right on the cusp. <laughs> somebody interrupt the signal, quick. Okay, so what I'll do is um, also because uh, I have a pretty hard out in about uh, yeah. five minutes. I want to do one more theory, and then we'll stop there. We're sort of halfway through this argument. So the next theory, a prominent theory of consciousness, because it follows directly on this, is worked not by uh, Bars, but Bohr and Seth. And they basically argue uh, that what, what, what is conscious, they do this thing about what is consciousness for and when do we need processes to be conscious and when do they move into unconscious? And so they talk about, well, like, 
they talk about the process of how you make pro how you make your behavior automatic. What they mean by automatic is things you can do without having any conscious awareness of it or, or very m m minimal subsidiary right. awareness, like when you're typing, right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you know, it can get very bad, like highway hypnotism, where you've been driving, oh crap, and you realize you haven't been paying attention or aware of the road at all. You've been off and mind wandering. <laughs> Who would have thought it? <laughs> but, but, but your zombie was doing a really good job keeping you alive. <laughs> right, it's but, kept me alive so far, John, so that's good. <laughs> and so they talk about, well, what the evidence seems to converge on is we need consciousness. So the opposite, what's the, op so we don't need consciousness when we can really proceduralize and make a, a, our interaction, right, automatic. Right. So what's the opposite of that? Well, we need consciousness where there's high complexity, no novelty, ill-definedness of the situation. Exactly the situations where you need a lot of what? Well, relevance realization. Mm -hmm. And what do they say consciousness does? Again, the, again, the fact that these are convergent, I, like, they say the job of consciousness is restructuring. It is doing that higher order recursive relevance realization because what that does is it enhances your ability to sift through the data, find the patterns, do the deep learning. So again, what are they saying consciousness functions to do? It's higher order recursive relevance realization that allows us to do sophisticated problem solving, makes us more intelligent, it's what areas of the brain? Oh, look, it's mostly frontal, but it's, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like all right. this, like convergence, convergence, totally. convergence, convergence. So, so I'll, just to put this in, in real world stuff. So uh, in my kitchen, we had the uh, silverware. I don't think I told the story. Silverware uh, in one drawer. Then we got a new dishwasher and then it had a handle on it. So we couldn't open that damn drawer anymore. So we had to move the silverware. It took me like six months uh, you know <laughs> to actually uh, to uh because i'd so procedurally habitually that to go over to the yeah. silverware drawer was downloaded i knew you know my system knew how to do that but then every time i'd open the drawer i'd be like you idiot <laughs> right i was like yeah, when are you gonna learn and, and that's because the surprise of seeing the drawer empty yeah. you know and then i had to rewire it and now you know three years later i never go to that drawer anymore so uh that gives you the frame about right. how that you know that's excellent i noticed how or and Seth feed back into Clearman's, right? And the whole developmental thing. You have to you have to relearn to find it conscious, right? <laughs> and so you can see the Bohr and Seth also being very, very um, well consistent and coherent with uh, the Clearman's and the developmental. And then that's also consistent, as we said, with this recursive relevance realization, massively hierarchical, dynamically self-organizing predictive processing, the anticipatory relationship. And notice we are getting so, so much of the function of consciousness, at least, is converging on the idea of consciousness as relevance realization within predictive processing. And notice how we aren't trying to make consciousness. All we're trying to do is make artificial general intelligence, but we keep building all the machinery, the functionality of consciousness. And we keep tapping into the same areas of the brain that are deeply associated with intelligence and uh, behavioral flexibility. And I have the intelligence to learn where a silverware drawer is after three months. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I am conscious at some level, John. That's good news. I'm sure you are. So what I want to do next, we covered off some of the main theories. Next time I want to take a look at uh, the last remaining uh, theory and draw it all together, which is Spinoni's integrated information theory. I won't go into great detail, but I wanna mention a few ideas uh, from the information closure theory, but I think they gel very well also with the model we're building here. Um, and then we will have done the canvassing. And what the overall, overall art, art of this argument has been, and you've been helpful, is this, how, how we can draw all these things together in such a coherent fashion and it's a completely naturalistic argument because we're doing it from the design stance. Every step along the way, this is what we would add to the machine, this is what we would add to the machine, this is what we would add to the machine. I wanna now just take a, a, a moment and say one sort of final thing that sort of helps also to bridge a bit between the function and the phenomenology. Because I would argue that salience is relevant to the global workspace. That you have all this relevance realization going on, but when information is relevant to the global workspace such that it does the working memory processing, it mm -hmm. looks for the restructuring, 
or it's potential. It is a it it, it 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 potentially demands restructuring mm -hmm. within the global workspace. I think that's when we're now talking about salience. Mm -hmm. And then once we have that, we now have the possibility, right, of demonstrative indexicality, salience tagging, all that stuff now coming online. That's a lot of pieces. It's coming together. It's a lot of pieces coming together. So we've got a bit more to go, and then um, we will have sort of made, uh, and then we'll have some time to draw it all together. Then there's, mm -hmm. you're going to take over, and you're going to make an important argument again. You're going to, what did you say, 30,000 feet? <laughs> you're going to go up to 30,000 feet and, um, and, 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 uh, and draw it all together again. And then we'll probably have one or two conversations around uh, the relationship between this problem and the hard problems of, of, of meaning. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the meaning crisis, and and then and, and then the relationship between that problem and what you call the problem of psychology. We can come back to that trial we'll to that. Mm -hmm. and see see what progress we've made on it. Really? So that that's our work for today. That's our work for today. I, and I apologize for uh, anybody watching it for any of the uh, yeah. little, little uh, pauses in the in the signal, but that's uh, technology is the god of, that limps, and of course our high god right now is the internet. And high gods always um, disappoint you when you most need them. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> right. right, but we're we're still sacrificing to yeah. you. Guys. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we still need you. <laughs> All righty. Uh, so as always, thank you, my good friend. Again, you did it. You like you these you just do these little things, and it was like a light of fire and connections would just spark for me. Uh, it was just fantastic. Thank you very very much. Hey man, I really enjoyed it. Thank you.